Hello everybody and in this chess master game video we're going to be looking at a match played in New York 1924 between Retty who was white and Emmanuel Lasker who was black and the theme of this game is attacking the center so the game starts off with Retty playing uh, the opening named after him uh, the Retty, who at knight f3, d5, c4, c6, b3, bishop f5, g3. So already we can see that Retty is going to set up a double finchesso with the bishops, and black has started off with a kind of Slav uh, position. And what's characteristic of these two openings is that the double finchesso uh, is usually about attacking the center. It's not about occupying it with pawns and pieces. And the Slav is uh, usually an opening where black holds back, sets up a very solid uh, position, and then slowly pushes forward. So it's interesting to see how these two styles are going to compete with each other. Knight f6, bishop g2, knight bd7, bishop b2, e6. So black has now got the pawn triangle, white has double finchessoed, and usually, uh, and in this game, there's just a simple setup of pieces. No, no fireworks just yet. Castles, bishop d6, that's already aiming to push e5, d3 from white, so it's just trying to very slowly control uh, some central squares, the e4 square in particular. Castles, knight bd2, e5. So black has got his freeing pawn break in there, uh, white has got some control over the light squares, as is typical of an English-type structure, which this game has become. Uh, here, white actually takes on d5, and black recaptures with the pawn. That's part of the reason that black has his pawns on c6 and e6 early in the game. It's so that you'll always have a pawn on d5. So right now, black is occupying the center with the two pawns. So that gives black a slight space advantage. And Lasker's knights and bishops are also very centralised. So n classically, uh, you would argue that black is already equal, if not better. Uh, but what the sort of hyper-modern uh, school of chess is, which it was developed at around this time, it stated that you would still have a chance of an advantage if you didn't occupy the centre directly, if you just had the pieces outside of the centre and were taking pot shots at, uh, <laughs> at the central pawn structure. And white is ready to start attacking black's kind of hanging pawns in a way. Normally you don't describe two central pawns as being hanging pawns, but I think here you can because it's hard to support them with any other pawns. So... Retty just plays rook c1. It's a way of uh, getting the rook to an active square. And here, queen e7. It's a good move. Rook c2. Now, I would never have played rook c2, or have, have, I'd never have thought of playing it. But it's a very interesting concept. What it's doing is it's allowing the queen to move over to b1 or a1, and then double on the c-file by moving the rook on f1 to c1. So it's an interesting way of uh, connecting the rooks. And here, if I was uh, Lasker, I would have played rook a c8. And then if white captures, I have the c-file. So queen b1, takes, takes, knight b6, rook c1, rook c8. And now White's, I would say White's uh, activity has been diminished here quite a lot. And the more exchanges uh, happen, the 
the more we get down to an end game. And I can't help feeling like Black's space advantage may be good in an end game. Uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but it it does feel that way. Uh, also, the rooks off the board would limit any uh, tactics that White may have to uh, disrupt Black's pawn structure. So that's what I would have done. However, in the game, a5 was played. So Lasker is trying to aggressively uh, go for the queen side by playing a4. Reti plays a4 himself. h6. So h6 is an interesting move. It usually is played partly to give the king luft, uh, to allow uh, the king to go to h7 for any back rank mating attempts. Also, knight h4 is quite common in the Slav, and black sometimes wants to keep hold of the f5 bishop, the light square bishop. So the move h6 allows the bishop to run to h7 and just stay nice and safe and only come out uh, near the end of the game. Queen a1. Uh, at the time, I'm not sure if this move had been seen very much, but nowadays it, it's uh, a recognised uh, thematic move in a kind of hedgehog structure, which is uh, basically what white has here. It's a kind of hedgehog. Rook e8 to protect the e5 pawn. Rook fc1. So right now, Reti has got both rooks active. Uh, the Finchetto is... Uh, creating pressure on black's pawns and in centre. The d3 pawn is holding up any advances from black. Uh, and if black does advance the pawns, there'll be a weak square left behind. Uh, and also the knights are fairly well uh, positioned. Perhaps the d2 knight could find a better square. Maybe, uh, maybe go to b5 or... Uh, C3 or E3 might be slightly better, but overall this is very good for white. It's almost optimal piece placement. And Lasker tries to improve his pieces with Bishop H7, so just uh, taking out any tactics and tucking away the bishop. Knight F1, so the knight is coming to E3 to target the D5 square. Now, knight c5 going for the b3 pawn and threatening the fork, taking advantage of white's last move, which was to unprotect the b3 pawn by moving the knight away from d2. Now, here, if I was white, I would probably... I'd probably play knight on f3 to d2, but this move is... A little bit questionable here. Uh, it may not be that good. But in the game, uh, Reti played a very different move. He played aggressively with rook takes c5. So he's giving up a rook for a knight, and after bishop takes, he gets a pawn as well. Now, this feels like a very double-edged position. It's unlikely the game will end in a draw. Uh, the question is, is Reti's exchange sacrifice for the centre pawn going to uh, be enough compensation, or, or is Black going to be able to consolidate and win the game with the extra material? So what White now may do is White has two central pawns as opposed to Black's one central pawn, so white may be able to occupy the centre now with his pieces. Rook a c8, knight e3. And I have to say that if I was Lasker, I would have played bishop takes knight, pawn takes, bishop f5. Uh, I feel here that my, uh, my exchange is probably going to be enough to win if I'm black. Just being a rook for a knight ahead, uh, well, a rook for a bishop ahead now. And also, it's only I'm only a pawn down, and white's pawn structure is not that good. So maybe in the future I can uh, win back the pawn. 
anyway, that that's what I would have done. But I'm not the chess grand uh, chess master. So instead, what Laska played was Queen e6. So he's just defending the d5 pawn, trying to keep the structure uh, pretty much the same, unchanging. And I think his plan is to optimise the placement of the rest of his pieces. Perhaps the bishop on c5 can go to a7. That way he'll have a kind of uh, double finchetto, in, in a way. Uh, and his knight's pretty good. Queen's pretty good. Maybe his rook on e8 could be moved to d8 instead. Uh, or he could double rooks on the c-file or e-file. So white plays h3 to stop any knight g4 uh, later on. Bishop d6, trying to remove white's excellently placed knight. Rook takes rook. So Reti feels now is the time to release the tension on the c-file. And he's now got the rook off the e-file, where perhaps the e2 pawn was a little bit weak. Unfortunately, the rook is now on the open c-file. So black's rook has found a good place to be. White drops the knight back to f3, but it's only a temporary retreat. The idea is to reroute it to d4. And at this point, there's also a very nasty idea of playing bishop takes f6, where even though white is swapping off, the resulting uh, pawn structure is so bad for black, as well as the d5 pawn becoming even weaker and probably dropping off eventually, white should have enough compensation for the exchange. Bishop e7 is played to protect f6 allowing the knight to reroute to d4, queen d7, king h2. So at the moment, white's pieces are practically perfect. So the only things that need to be looked at really are the king position, king safety, and the pawn structure. I think white's pawn structure is pr pretty solid. The only slight weakness is the b3 backward pawn. Uh, so the king position is improved with king h2. h5. So Lasko has realised that his central control is diminishing. So therefore, as there's no breakthrough for white in the centre, there's no way for white to really improve in the centre, he can uh, start an attack on the king side. Queen h1. Now, this is a move that uh, I thought was fantastic, and you don't see very often. White transfers the queen and bishop battery on the a1 to h8 diagonal, and instead he starts using the h1 to a8 diagonal, the kingside finkesso. So now it's targeting the fixed d5 pawn. h4, knight takes. So at this point, King h2 was actually a way of manoeuvring the queen to h1, which is very, very subtle and something I would not have seen uh, if it was uh, me playing as black over the board. So at this point, after h takes g3 check, f takes g3, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, white has managed to get back uh, onto level uh, material. It's now two pawns for the exchange, which is generally seen as being pretty much equal on material. As a very centralised bishop and a very centralised knight. And the bishops are pointing at black's king, so I would favour white here in this position. Bishop f6 to combat white's bishop on b2. And here I can't help but feel that white made a slight error. I would have played queen f3, just centralising the queen, and then perhaps playing e4 to uh, throw up my central pawns and gain some more central space. And then I feel that white's uh, method of playing this, this hypermodern approach to the opening, where he attacks the centre 
and only occupies it only only occupies it much later at the right moment, I feel that strategy will have worked. Uh, instead, though, Retty was a little greedy and took the b7 pawn, so he now has three pawns for the exchange. Rook c5. Bishop a6. Now, I don't really like that move. It, it's taking the bishop off the long diagonal, where uh, that bishop is perfect. Again, I would probably have played... Uh, maybe bishop e4 might be the strongest move, just trading bishops. But... Yeah, there's... Uh, there's not a lot of great moves, to be honest. But yeah, bishop a6 is not something I like. Bishop g6 is played. So white was threatening queen a8 mating, if black wasn't careful. But uh, bishop g6 allows the king to go to h7. And now I feel that white's bishop on a6 is a little bit misplaced. It's quite hard to find a good place for it to be. And the d4 knight is now being attacked. Queen b7, queen d8, b4. So this is a good move because it takes away white's uh, weak pawn. And if white can win the, win the black pawn back after rook there, queen b6, rook d7, I would have just taken, to be honest, but perhaps that's not playable. I thought white was sacking the pawn. Queen takes, rook takes. And now I think white is sacking the pawn. e3 takes. So if white can win the b-pawn back, I feel that he's, if not winning, then he's doing very well. King g2, bishop takes. And now this is unfortunately uh, one of the downsides of going the exchange down. Black can go all the way to the end game and even lose a pawn or two, and then play with being the exchange up and maybe only a pawn or two down. And it's very hard to uh, to fight off the side with the extra exchange because there's so few pieces on the board that the rook has become very, very powerful. If bishop takes, then I think black can play rook takes, pawn takes, b3. And the only way I can see of not uh, just losing to b2 and b1 queen is bishop c4, b2, bishop a2, but now bishop that takes d3. And after a5, queen takes, takes king f3 to prevent bishop e4, then Bishop d3, king e3, bishop c4. I think that black is just winning this get this endgame. Uh, the bishop should be able to restrain the two pawns because they're quite close together. They're only two file, uh, three files apart. And black's king should have enough time to get to a fairly active uh, point. For example, this is a possible continuation. Uh, and here, Black's king will just take the white pawns and win the game. So, unfortunately, Retty, who has played so well with his hypermodern approach, has to settle for e takes d4. And now his central pawns have become absolutely horrible, doubled isolated pawns. And they're the, they're the two pawns that white is up by. So now it's going to be incredibly hard to hold this position and draw. Bishop f5, bishop b7. Finally, the bishop is on the long diagonal again. Bishop e6. I think the reason that bishop takes d3 was not played uh, is that black doesn't worry too much about winning a doubled isolated pawn. He can win it later, at, you know, at a, at a better time. What black is trying to do is play bishop d5 check and exchange. That way white will lose the bishop pair that he currently has and 
it will be much easier for a, for a rook against a single bishop than a rook and bishop against two bishops, because the two bishops can coordinate really well together, but a rook and bishop are harder to uh, coordinate. King f3, and I'm very surprised that bishop d5 was not played. I think here Laska had second thoughts and perhaps was a little afraid of the white king becoming very active. However, I think I think just exchanging is absolutely fine for black here. Bishop b3, bishop c6, rook d6, bishop b5. So white's avoided the exchange, but again, his bishops are slightly passive. Rook f6 check, king e3, rook e6 check. And here's a critical point of the game. In the match... Uh, Retty, I think, just blundered here, and he played an inferior move. But he played king f4, just to show. Rook e2, bishop c1, rook c2, bishop e3, bishop d5. And now black is stopping white's pawns, and is planning to play b3, b2, b1 equals queen. And it's incredibly hard for white to stop the pawns the pawn and will probably have to give up material in order to stop it anyway so here Retty resigned but the interesting position though here was instead of king f4 king d2 and now it is difficult for uh alaska to win this but i still feel that the rook is going to prevail against the bishop White will probably have to lose a pawn and try and push up the A pawn. That's the one chance he has. But again, the White King is forced into passivity. The Black Rook is very active. The Black Bishop is centralised. So I think that Black can slowly uh, make inroads here. Uh, White's Bishops can become centralised, but again... Black is just improving the pieces, winning a little bit of material, and now it's just a, only the exchange up. Here, d5 does not work because rook takes c4 is check. So bishop e2 is quite uh, a nice idea. Rook g1, king d2, rook g2, king e3, rook takes e2, King takes, rook a2. And here, this is basically a one game. After bishop c5, uh, black can actually just sacrifice his rook for the bishop and pawn. This is a very common theme in endgames. Uh, going on equal on pawns, but being the exchange up, you can then sacrifice the exchange back in order to win a pawn. And here, this is winning for black. Only just, but a win is a win. So, I think going back to the, sort of the, out of the opening, it's very interesting to see how play progresses. White has basically set up uh, a hedgehog, uh, but because white has the first move, uh, he gets usually a slightly more active position than most hedgehog formations, at least uh, out of the opening. So already his, his queen and bishop are, and knight are attacking the dark squares, the d4 and e5 square. He's got a pawn and, and knight on d2 attacking the e4 square. The one square he's not attacking is d5. And black is occupying the centre, but doesn't really have any concrete threats, any real attack. And they both improve. White sacks the exchange, which I think is perfectly justified. And now he's attacking every single square, or, or controlling every single square, in the centre. So this uh, approach to controlling the centre uh, by using your pieces instead of your pawns and not so much occupying but 
attacking is uh, is quite an interesting idea. As you may know, I played the English opening, which is uh, similar to the way Ressi played in this game. So I, as my stamp of approval, if that means anything, uh, but I do realise that Black uh, can lay claim to an advantage if White isn't successful in coordinating the pieces and uh, and uh, combating Black in the centre quite early. So, after all this, I think that White's strategy did actually work, and he was outplaying Lasker here. This position, I would say, is winning for what, or better for White. It's only the fact that Retty got a little bit greedy and then played an anti-positional move, rook at, uh, bishop a6, getting his bishop off the long diagonal. And then the fact that he was pinned on the b2 to f6 diagonal uh, is, I think, what led to his downfall. It's just very hard for White to coordinate pieces. And the swapping of queens helped Black, because going down to this end game uh, is just fantastic for black the the extra pawns for white don't really compensate him for the exchange and then it's just one so i hope you enjoyed this video comment like subscribe and i'll see you next time bye